here we go. Let's learn about Tisha B'Av. This, this Sunday, nice to see you. Uh, this Sunday, this Motsay Shabbat Sunday, is one of the holiest days of the year, Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av. It's funny, it's, it's one of those days that um, is so huge in the spiritual world, in the Kabbalistic world, but tragically, it's not really appreciated, it's not really kept. In, in the wider Jewish world, it's not one of those things like first night Pesach, everyone's doing Yom Kippur, everyone's doing. But strangely enough, well, maybe there's a deep reason why that is. Unfortunately, on the Tisha B'Av, it's not widely universally understood, observed. Funny story, not funny story, I think a deep story. When I was in Israel a couple of years ago for Tisha B'Av, a taxi driver, I was getting a taxi the day before, and the taxi driver said, you know, Mazat Tisha B'Av, Mazat, Loma Ki Tisha B'Av. We never taught in schools, in the Israeli school system. He said, we taught about Pesach, Purim, Afilu, Purim we see, Tisha B'Av, Mazat. So he asked me basically to explain to him Tisha B'Av on one foot. And, and Hashem put it into my head to say, just look over there. And there's unfortunately in Tel Aviv, there's tremendous amount of homelessness, tremendous amount of homelessness. And there was this homeless man on the street. I said, imagine that that was your dad. How would you feel? How would you feel? He goes, terrible. I would do everything to, to help. I said, that's Tisha B'Av. Avinu Shabbat Shomai. Our father in heaven is homeless. Hashem Kavyachol is homeless. Hashem had a home. Called the Bet Amidash, that's where he wanted to live. He wanted to live with us. He wanted to have a world full of unity, full of connection, full of love, full of open miracles. And we threw him out through our sins. We're going to see soon. We kicked him out of his house. He's now homeless. Tisha B'Av is trying, not merely as we're going to learn to cry for what we haven't got, but for to cry for what we will get, please God. We're looking to cry to rebuild. It's a different type of crying as we're going to see soon. We're looking to cry to bring Hashem back into his house, to bring back, for bring us back into, into love, into unity, into good health, into the way it's meant to be. So we're going to learn about it. We're going to do a talk about the what, the when, and the why, if that's all right. Can we do that? The, the three W's, right? The what, the when, and the why. So first of all, what to do practically, what should we be doing observance wise? And again, for all of you, you're coming from very different places. Those of you who are listening now. So it's not all or nothing. In Judaism, it's not all or nothing. If you can do just a little bit more this year than you did last year, that's awesome. You've moved a little bit closer to Hashem. That's awesome. So but I'm going to give you the whole picture and then, and then what you can do, you can do. Here we go. Here's the picture. This is what the Shulchan Aruch tells us. First of all, this year, Shabbat is going from Shabbat to Sunday, which actually the Rav and Ebeshit says that's actually how when the temple was destroyed. Hashem destroyed the temple on a, on a Saturday night, going from Shabbat into Sunday. Message me later if you want to know a proof why. It's a very deep proof. And the Shabbat before, it's therefore called Shabbat Chazon. It's the Shabbat of the vision that we're, we're trying to envisage what the Bet HaMikdash will look like, how it can be, how we can have healing. But going from Shabbat into Tisha B'Av is quite interesting. A few interesting halachot, in short, from essentially in London, 10 past 9, from sunset, wherever you are, from Shkian, Shabbat, that's when we stop eating. It's one of the fast days, one of the, the big fast days to Shabbat Av. And though, though we can't fast on Shabbat, the last hour of Shabbat, since there's no mitzvah to eat, after sunset, we're allowed to start fasting from Sunset. So the sunset, even though Shabbat's not out, the fast comes in, but we don't yet wear leather shoes because the concept of Tisha B'Av, unlike the, most of the other fast days, it's a really high level of mourning. You know, we're all going to be with Isabella as he's been sitting Shiva last week. So we're all really now going to be really joining with you in, in feeling that Avelut, the whole Jewish people, and none of us can wear leather shoes. So that means if you're going to synagogue, you've got to take your non-leather shoes with you before Shabbat, because you can't wear non-leather on Shabbat. Sorry, you can't wear non-leather on Shabbat, but after Shabbat, you can't wear the leather. So you literally have to take your second shoes with you before Shabbat for those going to synagogue. But essentially, as soon as Shabbat leaves, Tisha B'Av comes in. The only Havdalah, we don't make Havdalah on the wine, we'll make Havdalah just on the, on the candle. And then we'll start entering to Tisha B'Av. We'll say the, the, 
Amida of Tisha, of, of the normal Amida, with a Havdalah in the Amida, and then go into Eichos. So the first thing, if you're going to be at home, this is Shabbat, the first thing is get yourself a Lamentations. You can go and probably find it on Chabad.org or Safaria. Just type in Eicha or Lamentations, and we should be saying Eicha together. As a people on, on Saturday night, it was written by Jeremiah, amazingly prophesizing what will be the destruction of the temple before it happened. Literally just describing what, what will be. Amazing. And we, we read that Saturday night. We don't do, obviously, joyous things. We shouldn't be washing our hands. So even so when we wake up in the, in, in the morning or after the toilet, we only really wash to the knuckles. You can't really wash your hands, obviously not with soap. We don't have showers. We don't have baths. It's proper... It's proper morning. We can't even sit on a high chair. We shouldn't be chatting with our friends. We shouldn't be saying, hi, how are you? We should just be pretty mellow, responding perhaps, really maybe trying to encourage, trying to comfort. But really, it's a very introspective, deep, deep spiritual day, especially at least till chatzot, at least till midday of Sunday. And then Sunday morning, again, we should do more prayer, saying what's called kinot, look up some kinot. You should be I definitely think that morning, at least try and be as super spiritual as you can. And then maybe the afternoon, my humble opinion, then you start putting, watching the Holocaust videos and Schindler's List and The Pianist and all that, if that's how you want to connect. Otherwise, you can read the book of Job. You can read the book of Lamentations. There's a tractate in, in the Talmud, Gittin, page 55, for a few pages, all des- describing the destruction of the temple. As one of, because you can't really learn Torah even on Tisha B'Av, because Torah makes you joyous. We're not allowed to have fun. We're not allowed to go and, and have kef and Torah actually, even though people don't realize it, is one of the most joyous experiences. We can't do that on Tisha B'Av. We've only got a select amount we can learn. We then put tefillin on in the afternoon for the guys. And essentially we're fasting all, all day and the fast comes out. It's a 25 hour fast. For those of you who, who want to do a detox or lose weight, there's that benefit. But at least till midday, which is when the fires of the temple were burning to its strongest, one should really try and observe as much as one can, if we can, till um, at least till Sunday afternoon. It's about in England, 104 Chatzot this, this year. But anyway, I'm hoping that as a result of all the Torah we're going to learn tonight, we're not going to need that because there's still a hope. And we're taught that Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. We're taught that when Mashiach comes, Tisha B'Av will be one of the most joyous festival occasions. That's why we don't actually say Tachanun. The Tachanun is the prayer, which is a sad prayer. We don't say that on the 9th of Av. In a funny way, we're not meant to be sad. Can you imagine? We sit on the floor and cry, but we're not meant to be sad. Go figure. Only Judaism come up with that. <laughs> You're not allowed to be sad. You have just to cry all day, but don't be sad. Don't despair. It's joyous. It's... So we're going to do some joyous crying. I'm going to try and teach you tonight what it means to joyously cry. Hopefully not visually, but, but metaphorically, spiritually. So that's what we do. That's what we do. Why do we do it? What happened, should I say? Let's just go through a little bit of the history. The first historical event, anyone like to quickly, I'm sure some of you know, in the Bible, where do, where's the first event on Tisha B'Av in the Bible? Just message in now, what, message in now, everybody, on Instagram, on Facebook. What? Life events happens on the 9th of Av. Time for you to message because there's quite a lot of them. Be interested to see if you can come up with all of them without looking at Chabad.org, right? How many tragedies tragically happened on the 9th of Av? So it starts off because otherwise we're waiting all night. Katie's going for the golden calf. Mm-mm, you have failed tonight, but you haven't really. It's all good. It's all parts closed. That was my birthday, Katie, you're alluding to. That was the 17th of Tammuz. Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz, 17th of Tammuz was the golden calf. To Shabbat Av, was anyone like to do it? Luchot Smash was 17th of Tammuz. That was you going for the 17th of Tammuz, which is obviously the three weeks before the destruction of the temple. And very much all part and parcel of the Tisha B'Av tragedy experience. But what actually happened in the Bible on Tisha B'Av? Ariel is going for Spanish Inquisition. It was, but what in the Torah, in the Bible? Spanish Inquisition was... A little bit later, in 1492, 3,300 years ago, this coming Saturday night, we were all crying. Why? Because God had said, I want you to go to the land of Israel. We started the talk saying, I want you to go to Israel. We should all be yearning, yearning for Israel. When God said, okay, it's time. Hashem said, it's time to come home. It's time to go to Israel. Do you know what we said? We said, can we see 
the bookings.com photos, please. I'd like to see like, what does the penthouse look like? You know, how nice is it five star? We wanted to see the pictures. We wanted to check it out with our own eyes. Tragically, we said we want to send spies and we sent spies and the spies came back with this evil report trying to slandering Israel, trying to dissuade us, dissuade us from going into Israel. If you want to hear more about the story of the Miraglim, sorry, the spies go to my, and please, if anybody you haven't already, please, if you can multitask, especially the girls in there, and the boys probably struggle with this, but the girls, if you can multitask and, and go to YouTube, J Network, 613 subscribe and then you'll be able to if you're interested to know what the whole story of the spies i've got a lovely talk on it a few weeks ago we spoke about the miraglim i think we called it the spy who loved me so yeah check that out and subscribe to the youtube but that's what happened we we cried and the famous line god said you cried for nothing Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now there's got to be something to cry about. You've got to have something to cry about. Not that Hashem said it out of, God forbid, some kind of vengeance. Now we'd cause such a terrible spiritual poison in the system. Now things are going to be messed up. The system now is going to require more crying to try and release from the tragedy of the first crying, which was essentially a crying of lack of belief, lack of wanting to go to Israel. Fear, despair, disconnection. And then tragically, that's what happened. In the first temple that we had 500 years later, we built the first Petah Mikdash with King Solomon's temple. And then 410 years after that, in the year 423 BCE, approximately 2,424 years ago, to, to Saturday night, the Babylonians destroyed Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed the Bet Hamikdash, the our beautiful, beautiful temple where Hashem was residing. That was it. It was up in up in flames, up in flames, and and all the tragedy that went with that. We were then exiled for the next seventy years. The story of Purim then happened. We come back, thank God, and we're able to build the second temple. It's called we called that Herod's temple. But then again, after four hundred and twenty years, exactly on the same day, and it's not a coincidence. It's not like mm, that was random. It's because. Hashem is putting that date aside for tragedy for the Jewish people. So on the same day in the year 69 CE, now about 1,952 years ago, the lovely Romans destroyed the second Beis Amikdosh and put fire to the Beis Amikdosh and then threw us out. And we've been exiled ever since, but it didn't just stop there. The tragedies of the Tisha B'Av, didn't just stop there. Oh no, back to me. So what else happened on Tisha B'Av? What else happened? So, Miri, nice to see you. Stay and give you a wave, right? Here we go. What else happened? The Romans actually did more tragedies. They, they actually plowed over the land of the Beis Hamikdash. On a few years later on Tisha B'Av, the tragedy in Betar happened on Tisha B'Av. In this lovely country I'm living in now, in England, in the UK, guess what? In 1290, on the 18th of July, which happened to be, guess, guess, 9th of Av, we were thrown out of the, the United Kingdom, thrown out of England. Thrown out of England. And then, in 1492, in Spain, we were walking out, crying again on Tisha B'Av, and unbelievably, the First World War itself started on Tisha B'Av. Many, many of the tragedies Second World War was around Tisha B'Av as well. And Tisha B'Av is, is a scary time. It's a scary time. We're told not to do dangerous things around Tisha B'Av. We're really told, like kind of what we were told in coronavirus, to stay in and hide during this time. This is a very, very dangerous time for the Jewish people. We shouldn't have court cases at this time. We, um, we really shouldn't be going in for, for medical procedures if we can prevent it around this time. Let's, things will get a lot better. After Tisha B'Av, my great rabbi, Rabbi Brevda, always used to say to me, he goes, Avi, things will get better in a week. Things will get better after Tisha B'Av. Things are hard now. So what I'd like to do with you tonight is really understand Kabbalistically what's happening. And more important, what should be our job? What is our job on Tisha B'Av? Our job is not to be depressed. It's not to be full of despair. It's not to be full of trauma. It's to be full of rebuilding. But how do we do that? And just... To explain in 2021, it's been a tough year for so many of you. You know, is he there? If you're still watching, is he there? Let me give me a message if you're still there. The father just passed away, and, and as he found her father, she's the one who, who found her dad, and that was so tragic.
traumatic. This is such a traumatic time for so many of us during coronavirus, the tragedy in Mehran. And then unbelievably on, on the 15th of Tammuz, on the 24th of June, on the 24th of June, hi, a guy that, that a lot of the community here in London were close to, wonderful young man called Benny Weiss and his wife Malky wanted to go and spend Shabbos with Malky's dad, Harry. Malky's dad, Harry, had had a really tough time. Harry Rosenberg had lost his wife to cancer. This year, he lost both his parents to COVID in New York. And he said, you know what? I just need a change of scenery. I'm going to move to Florida. I'm going to move to Surfside. And I'm just going to... He felt it was a new beginning. And that was the night. They just literally there a few hours later. Tragically, them amongst the other 95 till now that have been found dead. Can you even imagine that the horror... You go to bed at night and, and the horror of what, what it must have been just for, just for a moment. Because I think that's what really Tisha B'Av is about. It's about trying to get us into each other's headspace and to really have solidarity and empathy and sympathy and to put ourselves into the shoes of just for imagine for a moment. And thank, I would definitely recommend that's a little meditation you do over Tisha B'Av if you can handle that. Just start, imagine what it was like going to sleep in Miami and Surfside and, 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 and that building and then watching and then those who are awake when it happened, those who woke up and, the, and that God knows how many days some people were still alive for it. Just the horror. For me, that's another Tisha B'Av tragedy now. It happens already in Tammuz. For the mystics, you know, the lot of tragedy starts in Tammuz. In fact, we'll see Kabbalistically, some say Tammuz is even tougher than Av, is even harder than Av. And I really believe a lot of the pain that a lot of the community are feeling. This Shabbat Av is what happens in Miami this year. This beautiful little girl, Eli Sheva Cohen, 12 years old. She's sitting outside the building saying to him for her father, Brad, just praying, praying, crying for her dad and created such a beautiful Kiddush Hashem. They saw that's the Jewish reaction to, to tragedy. We, we pray, we pray, we keep praying. What does Hashem want from us? And I would like to share with you what Hasidut says, what mysticism says about generally tragedy, trauma, Tisha B'Av. And here's the point. We don't believe in despair. Rabbi Nachman used to say, Ein Yishbolam, there's no despair in this world. You know, Jeremiah wrote lamentations from a place of happiness. He wouldn't have been allowed to write Lamentations if he was depressed because a prophet can't receive prophecy if he's depressed. So he amazingly somewhat was joyous at that time. And we're going to learn that our reaction should not be a reaction of depression. It's going to be a reaction, hopefully, of deep connection, as we're going to learn soon. Just briefly before I go into that one one last point, it's really important to understand what the Talmud says. The Talmud says the first temple was destroyed and it says some of the spiritual mistakes. The first temple, there was idolatry, a lot of idolatry. There was, it says they didn't make a blessing on they learned Torah, which means, which means, listen up, it means they didn't value Torah enough. And, and it created a lot of spiritual chaos in the first temple. We had the best chance of our lives for, for unity in a utopian world and we blew it. The second temple, the reason why we're still here, says the Talmud is baseless hatred. Sinat Chinam. There was a terrible story of two men, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, that they were invited to a party and, and essentially they got the invitation wrong and really, and essentially this man was thrown out the party because, have you ever had that? where you got invited by mistake to the wrong party. But then you're literally thrown out and, and, and the man said, I'll do whatever I can, I'll pay, I'll pay for the whole party. And they said, get out. I mean, you're not staying in my party for another moment. And he left the party and said, you're going to regret this and went to the Romans and said, these Jewish people, you know, they don't like you, they don't respect you. If you even give them a sacrifice, they're not going to offer it. And, and the Romans said, oh, what do you mean? Of course they'll offer my sacrifice. And they he went and gave him the sacrifice and he made a blemish in the animal to the extent where now we couldn't offer the sacrifices and, and we, we didn't. And that was one of the core catalysts for the decision to burn 
the, the Beis HaMikdash. All coming from a break, all coming from an argument, all coming from being thrown out of someone's party and we're taught. Obviously, that was really indicative of the, the lack of unity in the Jewish world at that time, what was called baseless hatred. And Rabbi Desler said very, very clearly, Mechtam Eliyahu, that what's needed to rebuild the Bet HaMikdash is baseless love. Baseless love, loving someone just because. Lama la, feeling the pain of those who have died in Miami, even if you never met them, because we're brothers and sisters and we feel that pain. Okay. B'nai Soska. Let me go into Kabbalah now. Here we go. The way it works, every month, Hashem's name, the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He has a different computation, a different formulation. So what happens? What happens? In the month of Tammuz, it's totally backwards. The month of Av, the Yud and the He is backwards. It starts off with a He and then a Yud. And then it goes a Vav and a He, which means the first two weeks of the month is, is tough. Tough, the first two weeks. We're now on the fifth of Av. This is tough. It's actually the day that the Arizal passed away. This should be an Ali and a Shama for the Arizal, which, by the way, gave him the Arizal himself in Sfat. On the, the day he passed, he went to his student, Reb Chaim Vital, said, I'm going to be taken tonight. And do you know why? There was a big brogus in the community today. There was a big argument in our community. And Satan, till now, has been trying to take me for a while, wasn't able to take me. But once the, the argument came in there, Machlokas came in the community, Satan was allowed in. It just shows the power of Machlokas and we need to do whatever we can, especially in the coming days to Tisha B'Av, we need to do whatever we can to be peacemakers and, and to let go of broigases and just to let go of resentment and just to have, as we said, love for everyone, forgiveness for everyone. So the B'nai Sosra explains that the month of Av, Hashem's letters in the first two weeks is, is chaotic. He also ex explains it's the sense of hearing, which is the solution. He explains it's the symbol of the lion. He explains as the, the posuk, which, which very much embodies this month, is the posuk with the acronym of the hay and the vov and the yud and the hay. And it's a posuk, and you can check it out, in Deuteronomy. Haskes ushma Yisrael hayom, which means be attentive. And listen, shma, listen here. That's what the Arizal explains. It's all about hearing this month. Yisrael Hayom, and things will be good. It's a very positive verse. It's a verse where the Cohen's and everyone gets together and it's a day of joy and jubilation. So how is that? That this month, the verse of this month is a day of joy and jubilation and success. And we're taught again, it's the month where Mashiach is born in the day of Tisha B'Av itself. What's it got to do with hearing? And what's it, what's, what's it got to do with Shema? This verse is about Shema. What does it mean to listen? So the first thing I'd like to share with you tonight is from the Ishbitzer, the great mystic, the Ishbitzer, to explain about hearing. What does it mean to really hear? Right now, even now, right now, are you hearing or are you listening? What is the difference? If you're listening, it means maybe you're being a little bit attentive. You're hearing what the rabbi's got to say, but... Your first of all, who knows how, what other devices is on now. You could be watching Netflix, you could be doing loads of other things. Let's even say you're not doing anything else other than just now listening to the Torah. But are you really hearing it? Meaning, have you got your narrative going? Are you giving me a chance? Have you got an open mind? Are you open? Or are you very much, okay, it's a bit of a buffet. Okay, that makes a bit of sense. That, what's the rabbi on? No, nah, don't agree with that. Don't agree with that. Now, at the end, obviously, everyone needs to make their own informed decisions. But when it comes to spirituality, we're taught, we need to learn at times how to really hear. You know, I do a lot of coaching on one of my clients who wanted some relationship coaching. I really gave them an exercise of, because they weren't communicating well enough. And I said, listen, let one of, one of you speak and the other one isn't allowed to talk for 10 minutes. Not allowed to speak for 10 minutes. You've got to literally listen without interrupting. Can you do that? Anyone try that with your loved ones, with your spouses, with your friends? Try to have a conversation where you are not allowed to respond for 10 minutes. So you just have to listen and not only listen, you have to listen and put your own ego and narrative on mute. So you're just having this open mind and letting the words in. It's like you go to the beach and you start hearing and you're meditating by the beach, hearing the, the sound of the sea just flood into you. So when you listen to have to hear someone, 
the goal of hearing is to shut off your narrative, shut off your conversation that you're even might be having right now. You might be saying, what is the rabbi talking about? Shh. Just, you can say that afterwards if you want, but right now, just hear me. That's why we say in yeshiva, like, do you hear me? It's about hearing. Hearing is you've really penetrated what the other person said. You've let it in. You've accepted it. You've, you've taken it with love. Then afterwards, you can see what to do with that. But at least it's in. It's like the letter's been posted in the box. Most times the letter isn't in the box because you like, I'm not even listening. Even though you're presenting, I'm not even like, don't accept that, don't accept that, don't like that, don't like that. What's he on? Forget about it. Not interested. Or I'm angry with that person. Or We have to learn how to be open. The Maharal explains there's three kinds of relationships we have. And there's three kinds of, therefore, people we listen to and hear. Us and each other. So imagine, and I already wanted to do this exercise. This is the work of Tisha B'Av. To, and the, the work, work of the whole month of Av. To really learn how to hear. To listen. So to your friends. So next time you're with a friend, maybe you're with a friend that you have disagreements with, you see things from a very different vantage point, at least for the moment of listening to them, try not to see it from a different vantage point. Try to see it Dafka, from their vantage point. Go into their shoes and understand that if you were born with their parents, with their friends, with their environment, with their background, with their DNA, with their everything you'd think the same so give them that benefit of the doubt and just really merge and align yourself to their words and listen to their words and really hear their words and the same idea between you and Hashem obviously that when you read the Torah when you when you're praying when, when you are really trying to connect to Hashem really try and be open with that connection to try and take your walls away and, and the barriers away and just be super open and vulnerable. And critically, when you're with yourself, you need to really learn how to hear yourself too. This phrase, you ever use the phrase, I can't hear myself think? To hear yourself think, which means you, people, we've got this, this chatty, and it's actually really called the Yetzahara, the evil inclination's job is to distract us, is to delude us, is to harm us, is to defeat us. It's to taunt us. We need to learn how to put that on mute, our evil inclination on mute, our, our ego on mute, our lower self, our self-sabotage self on mute, and then really learn how to trust your gut and listen to your gut and listen to what you really want and really what you're genuinely yearning for. In other words, this, the first process of Shema, the first process of the work we need to do in Av is to, to mute your ego, to mute your Yitzhahara, to mute your lower self. And then it goes even a step further. The Ishpatsa said this amazing line. Listen to who he says. He says that hearing is actually deeper than seeing. Normally in the Talmud we say that Re'iyo Yosem Ishmiya, that seeing is greater than hearing. Because seeing now is something much more physical, it's something much more real, it's a greater sign of testimony. Then hearing, you know, you didn't really see it in Kabbalah. It's always the opposite. In mysticism, we say hearing is greater than seeing. That's why sometimes I close my eyes and I really apologize. Sometimes my wife always says, don't close your eyes when you're talking. But I can't help it. Because actually when I, when I have my eyes open, I'm more distracted. Whereas actually when I close my eyes, like now, ah, I can really start accessing truth in my inner world and I start channeling and, and really feeling a deeper connection even though I know it's really probably not great, but c'est la vie. But the idea is because when you close your eyes and you really listen, you see more. It's an internal experience. It's an inner world experience. When you see, this is an outer world experience. When you hear and really hear, it's an inner world experience. It says by Moses' father-in-law, by Yishma Yisro, and Jethro heard, he internalized. That's why our greatest mantra is we say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Hero Israel, we're really internalizing Hashem to you. We're, we're feeling you. We're connecting. We're not just listening. We're deeply, genuinely connecting. And that's what we need to, we need to learn how to almost hear with our eyes. So that's the, ne the next level up is when you see to do the same internal 
sight as such, to really have an internal inner world experience with your sight as well. But it really stems from the notion of hearing. And that's why the Mysteries explain that hearing is so critically important in this month. That's the first step. We have to learn how to, how to hear. Hear ourselves, hear each other, hear Hashem. That's step one in terms of the spiritual work of really trying to build the base amigdos. Trying to, that's what we want to do. We don't want to sit and cry this on the 9th of Av this year. We'd love to be celebrating and be having a beautiful meal, which we will when the base amigdos is rebuilt. Step two. What does it mean to cry? That's what it means to hear. What does it mean to cry? My friends, there's two types of crying. There's two types of crying. There's what we call crying over spilt milk. Anyone ever done that? Anyone actually ever spilt your milk and cried? I actually spilt my drink before. I didn't cry, but I was like, that's silly. But you can cry over silly things. For example, you ever been to the beach and you see some kids spending like hours building their sandcastles, hours, and then some lobbers, cheeky little kid, probably one of mine, comes and knocks it all over. And, and then the other kid just cries and cries and cries and is so sad. Do you know what's really tragic? When an adult cries over sandcastles, meaning when an adult cries over maybe work, maybe a bit of business, physical things, finite things, temporary things. Any English fans actually cried? Sherry, hopefully you didn't cry when Declan Rice, your West Ham player, was taken off and didn't cry when England lost to penalties. Anyone, people cried when England lost to penalties. So that kind of crying. Now, by the way, there's a picture of Harry Kane's wife crying. She was like, that could be more of a deeper cry because that was uh, her husband. But other than, <laughs> Sherry's with me, right? But, but, but I was joking. But I will allow Harry Kane's wife to cry because I think that was more of a deeper cry. But just some us supporters who have their team lose on penalties is not, thing, it's not worth crying about. God forbid we should waste our tears. That's, and here's the thing. A lot of tears are fake tears. We call it crocodile tears. By the way, anyone can message in why we call it crocodile tears. If anybody, anyone's owns any crocodiles or anyone's had any experience with crocodiles, why we call it crocodile tears. From my wide, vast experience with crocodiles, I think one of the ideas is that when they actually eat, they, they, they actually makes them cry, amazingly enough. So it's not tears because they're sad, it's actually tears because they're delighted that they're being nourished that they're eating, that they're devouring, and it's and therefore we need to be careful. That means fake tears, and some people are very good at fake tears, but even to themselves, some people cry, and it's it's not coming from, from your soul. Maybe it's coming from the ego, maybe it's coming from the child in us, it's not coming from the soul. That's how not to cry. That's how, the, I, and, and therefore, even to cry on Tisha B'Av, if it's fake tears or even Maybe even depression tears per se, that wouldn't be ideal either. I think there's maybe three types of tears, let's call it. We'll call it tears for nonsense. Tears with real sadness, but depression where it's despair. And there's not a lot of building we can do with that. And obviously someone who's just had trauma, that's actually very holy tears. But then there's a higher level of tears, which we're going to see soon. And the higher level of tears is the tears I hope we can all shed together. And that's what Jeremiah was referring to. Jeremiah, this amazing verse in Echa and Lamentations. The second verse in Lamentations says the following. <speaking in Hebrew> Which means she weeps bitterly in the night. Hashem, Israel, Jerusalem, the temple. We, we're weeping bitterly in the night. And her tear is on her cheek, says Jeremiah. Her tear is on her cheek. What does it mean to have the tear on your cheek? So, A, then it won't be fake tears. It won't be crocodile tears. If your tears on your cheek, there's a very deep level. Because that is the type of crying where you want to do something with the tear. You want to then use it to be a brick in the wall of the temple. 
You want to use it to build up your life, to rebuild your life, to reconnect, to move forward. Not a tear to keep you in the past, but a tear to move you forward. Do you know the first, what is the first thing? I'd like you to, I think I'm kind of giving it away. What would you have thought is the first word that Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, our greatest Jewish leader, ever articulated, ever said? Do you know what it was? The very first word he ever said, the very first word he ever said was, he cried. It says in Shemot, when he was the baby on the Nile, when Pharaoh's daughter, Basia, sees this little baby, it says, Vihine hanar boche. The baby's crying, but amazingly, it doesn't say the word tinok. It doesn't say yelled. It says nar, which normally means a 12-year-old, a, a teenager. Meaning that even then when Moses was crying, it was what we call the neshama cry. It was a soul cry. It was a mature cry. It was a deep cry. It was a cry to yalla, let's, let's move forward. I want to be with my mommy. I want to be with my father. I want to be reunited. I want to start building. I want to connect to love. I want to connect to Hashem. And, and she saw that cry. She really heard, should I say, she heard that soul cry. And she's like, I'm going to become Jewish and I'm going to save the Jewish people. And Pharaoh's daughter converted in the Nile. And help bring up Moshe Rabbeinu. Help, help bring up Moshe. That my mother's called Basio. So let's explain. What does it mean by, by holy cries? So let's share with you the words of Nesiv Shalom. But before that, any of you who are going through trauma, we've got Isabella there. We've got some of you who I know that are really in a lot of pain, have got broken hearts. What I say to you, and I've said to maybe some of you privately, is the mystics explain the following. Let's go a little bit deep. Any of you who really nurses a broken heart will describe the feeling that even when you go to a joyous occasion, a happy occasion, a wonderful occasion, let's say you go to a family member's wedding, but you're nursing a broken heart, you're kind of happy, you are happy, but that broken heart's with you. It's like someone who's got a limp in their leg. They're still feeling the limp. It's just not the same. It's not complete. It's not total joy. It's kind of joy with a but, which is interesting. Because Ave Lutz, and I'm, I'm going to, please God, with Hashem's help, my, my talk from last year, which when I was mourning for my father, I, sp I spoke about that, that Isabella should definitely listen to that. I'm going to put it on Facebook, hopefully, on, on Tisha B'Av itself and on YouTube, on Tisha B'Av. So subscribe to the YouTube channel. And we speak about Ave, look, morning comes the word Avel, but, but, the word but. We have this but. You have the beautiful occasion, but there's a but. You go to a great restaurant, but it's a but. Nothing's, nothing's good. So anyone who's really nursing that, who empathizes with that feeling that you carry this broken heart with you, I think there's a spiritual positivity we can do with that. Do you know what? Since the base Hamidosh has been destroyed for the past 2,000 years, Hashem himself has been nursing a broken heart. God's been homeless. Hashem's yearning for his temple. He's yearning for his people to be close to us, to be super close. That there shouldn't be these Miami tragedies and the Meron tragedy and, and the tragedy of the pandemic and the tragedies that Isabella just went through. We shouldn't have to go through this. Hashem doesn't want us to go through this. And he's nursing a broken heart. So when we're nursing our broken hearts, if we can then elevate it and say, Hashem, now I know how you feel. Now I know why when you have a beautiful new home, you're meant to leave a wall bare because we're still in a place of mourning. Now I know that even, please God, when my family members get married, when I get married, we're going to, if the best... Based on English isn't being rebuilt, we're going to smash the glass, not as a sign of celebration, but actually a sign that it's not complete yet, that we don't have completion yet, we don't have total joy yet. Once the base on English isn't, until it's rebuilt, it's not the same. There is tragedy in the world. So if we can learn to understand that our broken heart is correlating and finding allegiance and alignment to the broken heart of Hashem, that's a way to create Kedusha. That makes the broken heart become maybe even whole again and maybe fixed again. But it's a, it's a two way street. You should know that when we're sad, then Hashem's sad. So, so right now, Izzy, Hashem is mourning with you. Hashem is with you. It says when we cry, Hashem cries with us. And by the way, it says in the Talmud, 
page 32. Brachot, that the gates of tears are never closed. So by the way, next time any of you are feeling like you need to cry and you're feeling very, very sad and you're crying, quickly open up a book of Psalms and start praying for the things you want in your life. For those of you who want to get married, pray for that. For those of you who want to have children, pray for that. For those of you who want to have good health, pray for that. For those of you who want to find spiritual connection, pray for that. But when you're crying, use it, utilize it. Because actually it's an amazing opportunity for spiritual growth. It says the gates of tears are never closed. The numerical value, Bechi, tears is lave, heart. It's a deep time. So... When we cry, Hashem cries. When Hashem cries, we cry. A lot of our tears are because Hashem is crying and vice versa. And that's the love affair we're having. And that's really what some of the secret of Tisha B'Av. But now I want to share with you this holy book called the Nesit V'Sholem, the Slonim Rebbe. He says something very, very deep. Listen to this. First of all, he writes the following. There's an amazing episode, historical episode. Well, I don't know if you know that Plato, famous Greek philosopher Plato and Jeremiah lived at the same time. And when Jeremiah was crying over the impending destruction of the temple, Plato came to him and said, Jeremiah, I know you're a very wise man. I know you're wise, but you're crying over some bricks that aren't going to be there, like a broken building. A man like you, I've lost my admiration for a man like you. I admired your intellect. Now I'm not sure I admire you anymore, said Plato to Jeremiah. Why are you crying? And, and we're going to explain the answer soon because crying is the response that you're meant to have. But in short, Jeremiah said, you think I'm clever? Ask me, ask me the best questions, Plato, you've ever come up with. The best philosophical nuggets you've ever come up with. And Plato asked him his 10 favorite questions and Jeremiah I'll answered them one after the other after the other and said, I can only answer that because of that building, because of the Beis Amigdosh. The Beis Amigdosh gave us wisdom, gave us knowledge gave us real connection, real love, real happiness. It's not just the building, it's everything that comes with that. So for those of you who are going to struggle to feel, how can I connect to Tisha B'Av? I never saw the temple. I don't know what it was like. First of all, understand that anytime there's unhappiness in the world, it's only as a consequence of the fact that there is no temple. Anytime you've experienced unhappiness in your life, understand that if we could rebuild that temple, you won't have it anymore. Try and make it your own. Try and make it a personal experience. Understand that the trauma you've experienced, the obstacles, the walls in the way, the ignorance, the mistakes, all as a consequence of there not being this utopian oneness. That when we had this clarity and this oneness, we couldn't make mistakes. But let's say even more, because why did Jeremiah have to cry? So now let's go deeper. He explains the following. Same idea why Moses cried in the basket. What, what, is, what is real tears? He says like this. Listen to this. There's two beautiful Hebrew words I want to share with you. The Hebrew words are one is called a chukka and one is called ga'aguin. If you cry, not tears of despair, but tears of longing, tears of yearning, tears of wishing, tears that your soul is is just so sad because it the world isn't as it should be your life isn't as it could be that the jigsaw puzzle is so messed up is so full of trauma is so full of abuse is so full of pain and hurt and the soul knows we could have it so much better that's the point if you're crying to rebuild if you're crying because you're longing there's a chukka you know i feel Whenever I'm not in Israel, and I've now have not been in Israel for about a year and a half, my soul is literally bursting to be there. My nishan is like, <gasps> it's my spiritual home. Like, I, and I can't, I just dream of being by the Western Wall and just touching the Western Wall and praying there. And that's not even the temple yet. That's just an echo of what it's going to be like. It's like there's this calling and that's home. And our soul, if we're open to feeling the sound of our soul is just yearning to be home. It's just yearning to be with Hashem. It's just yearning even just to walk around in Israel. That's what it means, the ga'aguin. You've got these pangs of yearning. It's a bit like if you're in love and, and, you, and, and you're, you've been distanced from each other for whatever reason. One of you's, 
in another country. And by the way, that just, Hashem has put into my mind, I want to also in the merit of, of the Torah we're learning today, the, the wonderful young Jewish ambassador for the Jewish people for Israel all over social media, Rudy, who's been kidnapped in Nigeria. Hashem should, another Tisha B'Av, horror. Hashem should have mercy and, and should release him and his two friends immediately, please God, and he, should, he shouldn't know pain. As we said, it's a very broken world and it's just terrible broken things happening time and time again. So, so can you imagine Rudy's family now? They're just feeling broken that they just want to be with him. They just want to be with him. So that's how we should be feeling, wanting to be with Hashem, wanting to be with, the, with our people, wanting to be in Israel with the rebuilt Yerushalayim. That should be what the tears are. And he explains the following, that the key avelos, the mourning, is the tzmicha, is, is part of the growth experience. It's like, it's almost like, it's almost like when you plant seeds in the ground, when it starts raining, things start growing. When we start crying, if it's the right crying, things start growing. And by the way, even if it's not the right crying, Hashem loves us and, and it can be used for good. But now, hopefully, as a consequence of what we're saying, you can start acknowledging and accessing, as we said, the right tears and directing your tears for growth. Directing your tears for, for growth. We say when Mashiach comes, we say every day in the Amidah, Esemach David Abdecha. That we want David to sprout out, smicha, like vegetation, like growth. The tears of the water, which helps grow, which helps bring the growth, which will bring the salvation, which will bring the solution. That's what it means that the, the tears are left on the cheek because it's real. You're doing something with those tears. You're using it for growth. You're using it to get us to where we need to get to. And he says the following. It's not tears for the destruction. It's the tears to build. That's why we say in the Amidah, We're building in the present tense. We don't say Yibaneh. The one day we'll rebuild. We can build it now. The Torah we're doing now is definitely building the Beis Amidah. Every time we cry on Tisha B'Av, it's tears putting another brick in the wall, another brick in the wall. We're getting closer and closer. Tisha B'Av, in a weird way, I am hoping, is going to give you a very positive experience, a very joyous experience even, because it's going to make you feel closer to Hashem. We're living in a world full of such distraction, full of such ego, full of such sadness. It's so wonderful. When we can have a day without distraction and we can just really listen and really hear our inner world, what's really going on spiritually. You know, it says that, that when the temple was destroyed, when the temple was destroyed, we had these cherubs in the temple and the cherubs were always positioning how Hashem was feeling towards us and the position that Sunday morning when they came in to see the temple was the position of embracing. The two cherubs were embracing, meaning the love Hashem had for us at that time was even greater than ever. So when we're going through these tragedies and more tragedies, the love Hashem is feeling for us is tremendous. That's one of the reasons it's called Av. Av means father. This month should have been called, you know, something horrendous. But actually we call it father because actually, A, if we're going to have a tough experience, we want our father to do it, number one. Number two, the love that a father has for the child when the child is going through the pain is so tremendous and so powerful. That is the, the relationship that Hashem has got with us. Hashem has got with us right now. So let's go on to conclude. A few last stories and then I'm happy to take questions at the end. Story number one. So I think this story is really quite emotional for me. Hopefully you enjoy it. I feel it's very beautiful. From the Bob of a destiny, dynasty, should I say. The Rabbi Nachman talks a lot about Tisha B'Av. He talks about the egg. That's why you were meant to have always an egg during the meals of mourning because of the roundness because life never stops life continues this world continues to the world to come it's not the end it's the beginning it's a circle of life there's a beautiful story which represents this stay with me for this story it's beautiful the story goes like this a true story in the bob of dynasty there was a man who came to the rebbe and said rebbe you got to help me you got to help me 
I'm in trouble. There's a landowner that is threatened to kill me, to beat me up if I don't give him the money I owe him. I just don't have the money. I, I owe him a, a thousand a thousand rubles. And if I can't give him that thousand rubles, the porrits, the landowner is threatened to do terrible things to me, maybe kill me. So the rubber says, let me just think a minute. Let me just see. He says, you just need to hide. Hide, hide, hide away. But in that room, the holy Rebbe, of the Rebbe, his teacher was in the room and said, one minute, one minute, come here. And he closed his eyes and said to him, no, 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 you don't have to hide. What you need to do is you need to say to the landowner, you have to give me 10,000 rubles. You have to give me 10,000 rubles. So that was very strange. So, so this man who's on one hand being told to hide, now being told to ask for 10,000 rubles is getting very confused. But he says, okay, I've got, I don't have to hide anymore. And that's it. He went to the landowner and had that meeting and they said, sorry, I, you know, I don't have the money. The landowner said, you don't have the, the money? And he started beating the living daylights out of him, nearly killing him. The landowner went back. He was actually had quite a bit of fun beating up the Jew that day. And his wife said, what have you, why are you in such a good mood? You look in a very good mood. And, and the landowner said, because, you know, I just uh, had a bit of fun with one of my old tenants. And his wife said, what did you do? And he says, maybe I've killed him. He goes, do you realize that if this comes out, we could lose everything, absolutely everything. If, if the authorities hear what you've done and it's not your money, it's my money, we lose it all. You go back and you make up with that man and you apologize and you need to do whatever you do that he doesn't sue you and he doesn't tell the authorities on you. And the landowner all of a sudden is now sobered up and has realized, uh oh, he's in trouble and runs back now to try and find the Jew. And finally finds the Jew who's now nursing all his wounds, very, very ill in his home. And the Jew sees the landowner coming in. He's like, oh my gosh, he's come to finish me off. And he comes in the room, comes in the room and he's thinking like, don't kill me, don't kill me. And the landowner says, I actually have come to say, I'm really, really sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And that's when the young Jewish man remembered what the Holy Rebbe said. Ah, he said, you know what? I'll only accept your apology if you give me 10,000 rubles. You give me 10,000 rubles. And the landowner is like, starts laughing. You want me to give you? And then the landowner realizes that if he doesn't, fix this he's not going to be allowed back in his house and he could lose everything he's fine i'll give you ten thousand rubles he gives him ten thousand rubles a few months later the jewish guy comes back to the rebbers and says to both rebbers what was going on here you told me to hide you told me to ask how did you know so the first rebbe said listen i saw what was going to happen you were going to get beaten up i said you should hide and they turn now to the older rebbe the Heiliger Bob of a Rebbe and said, so how did you know? And the Bob of a Rebbe said, listen to this. He said, you saw what was happening. I saw what was going to happen. You saw the present. I saw the future. My dear friends, this is what we need to do. When we're going through trauma, let's not just look for what it is now. Understand there's a bigger, bigger picture. There's this world and the next world. There's trauma, but then there's healing. There's destruction, but then there's rebuilding. Rabbi Akiva himself, Rabbi Akiva himself, when he witnessed the destruction of the second temple and his students were crying, he was laughing. And they said, Lama why are you laughing? And he goes, because I know that the prophecy which said that the, what you can see the foxes, the foxes are coming in. The same prophecy will come true, which says one day there's going to be yeladim v'yeladot. There's going to be boys and girls, masachim. They're going to be playing in the streets. And if that prophecy came true, I'm watching the, this, the building of the third base of Mikdash. I know it's going to be rebuilt. And this is what we need to really connect to, my dear friends. A, in our own personal lives, when we're going through personal tragedy, we need to sometimes just understand even in our own world, please God, we're going to see good times and things will be rebuilt and things can get even better in our next phases of our chapters. 
And then let's say the tragedy just now in Miami, where those that have died, that at least that they are now in Gan Eden. We believe in the afterlife. We, do, we actually believe this world's the dream and the next world's reality. We believe in the bigger picture. We believe that the world to come is the place of infinity and this is the place of, of, of finitism. This is very physical and that's spiritual. This is finite, that's eternal. So if we look at that bigger picture, it not just brings us comfort, but it gives us something yearning, longing. When bad news happens to us, understand that please God, good news can unfold. But more than that, more than that, Warabi Kiva is understanding is therefore we should always see the positive. Always know that in the end it will be okay. There will be a third base of Miklos. It's a promise in the Torah. And by the way, all the other predictions have come true. And by the prerequisite of the third base of Miklos was the Jewish people, which were going to be scattered in the four corners of the earth, were going to start coming to Israel. That's happened now over half the people are there. If you would have said 70 years ago for those Jewish people who were crying in Auschwitz, that in over 70 years time, over 7 million Jews are going to be living in Israel, they wouldn't have believed you. But that's what they were crying for. They were crying for longing, for returning, for a better future. We're, we're so close. Another, another promise in the Torah was that there'll be teshuva, there'll be a lot of returning. People will be saying, you know what? I want to change. I want to return. I want to do more. I want to have a better, more spiritual life. Thank God that's happening too. So these steps are happening and the third step will happen soon. Please God. With the building of the third base Amigdash. Let's just finish off with one Last story from the Kedushas Levi, just to help us. The Beditshava says that he uses the parable of Sishabah of the following. He says there was a powerful king who ruled over many lands. He said the king's greatest gift, the king, what gave the king greatest joy was his relationship with his son, with the prince. They used to spend so much time together, rejoicing together an unfettered relationship. Everyone came to adore the boy. But as the boy grew up, the boy started to be this unruly teenager a little bit. Disregard his father's command, act in a manner that was unbecoming of the crown pins. He was cynical. He became rude. He, he, he disobeyed his father. His father didn't know what to do. The father thought, you know, I'll do an experiment. I'm just going to go and and... Give him a bit of a shock factor of take him so far away from the palace, so far away from me, that he, then he's going to want to return. And he did that. He, he banished the son from his kingdom. And he put him in a very uncivilized town. And that town he felt the prince wouldn't dream of wanting to stay. But after a few weeks, the prince kind of got used to it. And year after year, the prince is now super, even more disconnected, actually not realizing he's a prince anymore. He's He's being very, very uncivilized in a very unspiritual place, forgetting about the king, forgetting about the king. So the king is now, now what do I do? I've lost my son, I've lost the prince. So the, son, so the king says to his guards, what I want you to do is, is ever so often go around where my son is and just sing songs, do acts, blow trumpets, remind him of the palace, do acts to remind him of me. See what you can do to remind them. And they used to do that. They used to go around and initially he was oblivious to it. And finally, one day, the prince really opened up his heart to hear the trumpets, to hear the sounds, to hear the songs, to hear the music that his father would have in the palace. And the son finally felt that deep connection back to his father and said, I want to go home. And eventually went home. And that's Tisha B'Av. Hashem just wants us to come home. He just wants, but we need to want to come home. We need to want to say that what's happening in our lives, when I say to someone, do you want me to share to someone? They say, one minute, I've got my summer holidays booked first. Can it like be, and then I've got that book. Can it be maybe like in like a couple of years time? We've got to stop that. We've got to say, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to pack my bags. Any of you, would you be willing to pack your bags tonight? For those of you who are not in Israel, for those of you who are in Israel, to change your plans and just to, to change our lifestyle somewhat. Are you ready for that? If we're ready for that, it can happen. So the final, my final lines is the final words that Kedushas Levi says, or Levi Yitzhak says, we say this line, whoever mourns for Jerusalem, will merit and see its rejoicing. They're connected. And now we're learning how they're connected. But the Kedushas Levi says, Zohar doesn't just mean to merit, it means whoever mourns, Zohar becomes cleansed. 
When we mourn, we actually become uplifted. We stop being so stuck and in, in our selfish ego world and we start waking up to a higher reality and more important call of life and we want to live a better life and therefore when we mourn if we mourn now and mostly mourning on Tisha B'Av let it be a time of inspiration let it be tears not of despair but tears to reconnect tears to repair tears to reunite tears to realign with ourselves with our people with Hashem and please God it should be a moed and we shouldn't have to cry and, and please God we're all going to be celebrating and rebuilt based on Migdash so that's me I'm going on holiday see you later anybody got any questions I'm happy to take some questions any questions anyone I'm out I'm tired but it's it's so deep it's so beautiful to Shabbat Av there's a great website called Torah Anytime, there's going to be lectures all day on Tisha B'Av. If you go to Torah anytime, try and listen to that. Check that out. I'd also put my last year's Tisha B'Av talk online over Tisha B'Av as well. But wishing you all tremendous happiness and blessings and success. Wishing Isabella tremendous comfort. You shouldn't know any more sorrow. And you should only know joy and, and happiness and Hashem should bless you tenfold. So wishing you all uh, lots of love. Hopefully I will get to Israel and, and hopefully I'll be there soon. Yeah, hopefully in, in a week or so. That's the plan. But let's see what Hashem has in mind. But message me if any of you have got any questions. And wishing you all a lot of love. God bless. Bye.